Um, and you're going to say, what's an Aggie talking about in a TEDx? So I'm an Aggie at a TEDx. Um, but I guess we all join together because we all eat food, right? And uh, so I'm going to talk a bit about what, what this Mission 2050 is. And uh, it used to be, we used to call it a vision. And then I thought, oh, I think I've got all the answers. We might have converted to a mission and get the thing done. So it's a conceptual design for the next 40, 50 years of research in dairy, swine, and poultry, environment, etc. And it just doesn't look like your normal dairy facility, does it? So the next slide here is, um, is a picture down the back lane of my place. It's a little foggy. It's the future. I mean, the best way to predict the future is to create it. So I created it. And uh, I worked on this project for 10 years. 10 years it took me to get it to fruition. We were actually opening up part of it probably within, the, probably by May or June. But when it comes to the future, there's three types of people there. I'll let you read it. And I hope that there's all the people here who want to make it happen, OK? Now, a lot of people say, well, what's this? This is my, my rocket cow, I call it. And, um, and when you're dealing with, and we had a number of comments about physics and, and engineering and physics, physics is pretty easy. Gas A, gas B, put them together, it blows up. But when you're dealing with biology, it's really, really hard to find out what that animal's thinking, what kind of stresses it has, where does it need to go, is it free to do movements within a facility? So there's some real challenges there. Skill testing question, what do you see in front of you? Five, four, three. <laughs> you see the Great Lakes? I don't see the Great Lakes. I see the food basket of the world. That's what I see. Where are you going to find all the fresh water there? Nowhere. That is the food basket of the world. And we don't know it. We don't know how lucky we are living in a beautiful province like this and actually a beautiful country. We don't know how good, you just don't know how good you have it. I've been in a lot of different countries, the same as Barbara, and I've seen a lot of things that are not really good. But we got it made. That is the breadbasket right there. Now, I talk about the elixirs of life. And air, obviously the number one nutrient, how long can you hold your breath? The air in this facility, you know, it's very hard to emulate air. You take Mother Nature and bring it inside. It's number, air is the number one problem in every building envelope that you see in the world, okay? So I started to look at that. And this is a beautiful picture in, in Switzerland. Water, number two nutrient, kind of important. I think we forget about it. And then light. Light is your metabolic modifier. It, it actually controls your circadian rhythm. Now, it's approaching 3.30. Your melatonin levels will start to get up about 4. The heat increment digestion that you ate in combination with melatonin, you should all be going to sleep pretty soon, OK? But I'll try to keep you awake. Now, so I had to look at what's, what is the future of agriculture? Because I have, to, I have to get about 400 scientists increase their scope of what they actually have to do research on. And so these are sort of the viabilities. We've got air, obviously, water, soil and land, energy, labor. These are all issues that you can pick any discipline you want. It's basically the same thing. It doesn't matter what it is. Then air, if you look at the uh, NRC uh, booklet here, is the biggest problem that we're going to have in the future. It's how are you going to cohabitate 30 million more people that want to live in this lovely province, and yet you have to feed them all. How are you going to have building envelopes with animals in it and that the neighbors don't complain about it? And so it's very tough to do that. And it becomes a very, very tough challenge to create an envelope that has zero emissions. This one, the water. I saw that lovely bridge over there in Isfahan. I was there. I can tell you right now there's no water running under that bridge. And they have a problem there. But water quality, water rights. Who owns the Great Lakes? It's a question. You don't own your water if you have a well. It's a natural resource. You don't own it. Okay? And then aquifer stability. We have lots of water, 
but in some cases, is that aquifer reducing? It actually is reducing in the province of Ontario. And then are we irrigating forages as well? One of the things is if we want to build new envelopes is we have to look at conservation authorities to say minimum distance away so that you don't pollute that water. So there's all these issues I have to start to think about when I'm trying to build something for the future. And soil, they're not making any more of it. At least I haven't seen anyhow. So what are we gonna do with that? Here's a nice picture here where we have uh, Sam's Club and a barn behind it. And the funny thing is that actually the Sam's Club went out of business. <laughs> but uh, see how close it is approximate to that. So how are we gonna cohabitate people? Everybody's coming to Ontario. If you look at the shift, they're running out of water in the southwest in the US and they're migrating in the future towards water. So that's one of two things, raid right on your natural resources or a potential market. Depends on which way you wanna look at it. And this is a funny slide. Here we have, you know, trying to market land and I, I've never seen Lake Huron like that, uh, <laughs> ever. Um, but uh, I guess you can uh, surf out there. I, I haven't seen it, but I've seen it probably in the winter time, but I don't think I'd be surfing there. But that's just kind of odd. The other one is energy, you know? You know, what are the embodied costs of producing food? Where do they come from? We talk about sustainability. I'd rather look at embodied viability. That means every part of the chain has to be efficient and, and, and sustainable versus the whole global thing. And energy crops, I mean, you know, producing ethanol from corn. What's the future gonna be? Well, the future is, Everything has to go through a person first. So if you took cereal grains and you took corn, it goes through a person, the human side first, and then from there we will take the byproduct to either feed it to animals or looking at soil application for it. And wind, is this skyline pollution? Because we see the number of windmills that are out there. How does that affect the environment? Lots of things to consider when you're trying to develop this plan. Well, what about the future? Robotics. We have tons of robotics now in the dairy industry. Tons of stuff. Every cow can be milked individually in a robot. No problem at all. There's probably more robots put into farms this year than ever has in the last 10 or 15 years. Nanotechnology. We can take biological sensorics right now. I can tell the heartbeat and respiration rate of a, of a dairy cow. And non-invasive, it's just a little collar, and it sends a message to the building envelope, <coughs> pardon me, the building envelope, and it says, increase the ventilation because this animal is getting a little stressed. We can censor probably everything metabolically in that animal right now. Is there gonna be individual feeding in the future? Yes. Are we gonna be looking at fractional feeds? Meaning, we take all the byproduct from the human side and we try to make it more efficient for the animal because everything is human first into the future. And then we can look at fractional milk technologies as well. And then the interesting one too is removable building technology. I want to be able to put up a building today, I can use it for two years, then I can take it down and dismantle it. We can do that. We can do that in all the species. It's no problem at all. The technology exists. Now, I think you know what that is. It's the enterprise. Anybody that's a Star Trek fan, that's where they the enterprise was named after. I really love your bridge. As an architect, I'd say, that's a beautiful bridge. As an engineer, I'd say, it's not structurally sound. <laughs> so how do I get an engineer that's condemning it from structure and an architect that says it's beautiful? So I want to end up with a beautifully uh, functional and structured and, uh, bridge. I don't think we need a bridge. I think we need a bridge is right there. The bridge is the captain that's on there. And what that captain, he or she has to do is be compassionate and passionate and enthusiastic about whatever subject that needs to be moved into the future and advanced. That person, that champion is most important person on the bridge. And that's what I did. I spent 10 years taking everybody's ego 
into consideration. And if you know, if you work in University of Guelph, there's lots of people that have egos up there. And there's lots of people, other universities have egos too. And then there's stakeholders and industry people that have egos. And you have to put it all together and they all have different thinking. But if you go back to the original concept of what is the future and what is most important to the future, then you can bring everybody together. And so I, I, I had to go around and say, well, what, what kind of technology is out there? And I didn't want to go, go see this particular barn and this particular barn. I don't want same old, same old. We hired an architectural firm downtown Toronto. Why? Because I can teach them about livestock and they could teach me about architecture. And it was a great bridge building exercise. Absolutely the best one ever. And so when I look at this ship, I look at the bridge as for direction. But I also look, this is, if you look at all the new aircraft carriers, probably the most advanced systems in the entire world. Same as submarines. So I thought, what can I take from those uh, mechanical ventilation systems, etc., and how can I bring that into a building envelope? Because in the future, a building envelope, even for humans or uh, for animals, has to generate as much income from the building envelope as what's housed inside it. And that's the future. And that's the way we're going to get solved in most of these issues. And so I went to the medical side of things. Because mostly on the medicine side, they have a lot of advanced systems. What can I see on that side of the discipline and bring it to agriculture? In fact, most of the stuff, even this heart, a lot of the heart work, a lot of the reproduction work, all was done on cows first. And then it was applied to humans. So the cow is actually a pretty good model for human health. And then I went to the physics of the future. And I said, why, well, what's, it, what's in here? Can I, what can I learn in here that I can apply? So I read this book about four times. And it's a hard read, but it's pretty interesting about what's happening when it comes to how to look out the next 100 years. And so how do I get my engineers, my physics people, my architect and my engineer and everybody to agree? That was a huge challenge. But one of the things they always was, they loved my enthusiasm, which is probably the greatest asset to ever have. And I was always on them, always, always, what about this, what about that, what about this? I, I, somebody tell me, well, you can't do this. I said, well, what about this? And they go, oh, okay, maybe. Well, let's try it out. And so when you talk about that bridge and that person and that champion, that's the person you need. And everybody in here is a champion. Everybody can do this. It's not a problem. All you need is, is enthusiasm. So then I went out, I went to Phoenix. And this is the Biosphere 2. Because one of the major issues with new technology and in the application of new technology. This, this is a biosphere too, it's $400 million to try to reproduce if somebody can live on Mars. So these biospherians had to go in and they had all different types of systems. But the human factor was always negative, ne no, it's not gonna work, it's not gonna work, it's not gonna work, it's not gonna work, don't do this, it's stupid, spending $400 million. And so sometimes it worked, sometimes it did. The press was all over this, they watched it like a hawk. Well, what happened when they started it was the plants didn't grow enough because the plants are supposed to produce oxygen for these people. So in the middle of the night, you see these oxygen trucks come in in the night and they cut a hole in it and they put in like 50 or 80,000 liters of oxygen to get, you know, keep the people happy. Uh, but the failure here, it was not technical. The failure was the human factor. And if we look at sustainability, probably the easiest thing or what we should concentrate on is sustainable behavior. And that's what I kind of did when I dealt with my little silos of everybody, is to challenge them on sustaining their behavior towards a common goal. And that was a real challenge. And they had all these in beautiful like, uh, uh, tropical areas, et cetera. But really, the real the issue here is the human factor. And so I'm gonna show you a, a bit of a design here. And this is the bicycle uh, going up to this uh, new uh, facility. And I'm, I hope it works. Whoops. And so what we have here is the poultry facility. Now, I did the Star Trekian thing. If it didn't all join together, I can actually pull them all apart. And they're all separate. 
And here we have a dairy facility. And then uh, we show you into uh, on the um, energy park and we had green roof technology, burning, wind, et cetera. Um, and then it flips around here to the front. Uh, we have the artificial trees, first of its kind ever, um, which in the leaf, because if you can create photosynthesis, artificial photosynthesis, we can get rid of a lot of things. And then it comes into sort of a, an integrated research area where getting all the different researchers from different disciplines actually have to say hello to each other sometimes and actually gets thinking going. And so that's the front door as you walk through. And so just to recap here, it's a fairly large space, it's about 500,000 square feet. But right now we are actually at the process of just doing the dairy facility and these wings have moved off and we'll probably move them somewhere else. But it's been a real challenge to do this. And we have crops, we have poultry, dairy, swine, industry, uh, education, and energy. And trying to bring those people together, that was a huge challenge. The design, five minutes. <laughs> really? Getting everybody to agree, 55 minutes, okay? Every hour. And then we also looked at all this different uh, green roof technology, so spray on photovoltaics. We have the University of Toronto. Interesting thing, I had an engineer from Germany I said, I gave them the thermodynamics of a facility. I said, this is how much energy is being created by this um, body, and this is exhaust. These are the emissions. Can you solve this issue for me? He emails me back. He says, yes, we can solve it. You do this, 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 and this. And he said, Osborne, by the way, you've got a lot of kids in that school. I never told him it was a dairy facility. I never said a word about it, what it was. He thought I was working on a high school or something. He thought I had 2,000 kids in a school. But he solved the issue. And we actually solved the issue. This Actually, we have a design which is zero emissions. The only thing that comes out of that is meat, milk, or eggs. We've taken all the technology and architecture. We take the engineering. We've got earth tubes. We've got photovoltaic. We've got, we use water at least six or seven times. We actually have, instead of that, uh, um, wind tur power turbine there, we actually have the turbine built into the roof, which no one has in the world. So this is actually the first zero emissions. All conceptual, we will get to it probably uh, in about five or ten years once we get, get the dairy portion of it done. But lots of interesting things to do out there. And again, uh, robotic milking and, and, and we got a biodome and we got to look at emissions. Because emissions in the future, potentially, we will be taxed according to our emissions. And so just like how many garbage pails you take out to the end of the driveway, you might get your tax reduced. Maybe, I'm not sure about the city of Guelph though. One of the interesting ones is hydroponics. I'm looking at greenhouse technology. We have a really mature greenhouse industry in the province of Ontario, a really mature industry in the dairy side. Those two have never got together. We've actually designed 50 medicinal plants that we can actually propagate in a greenhouse beside the dairy facility isolate that uh, factor out, feed it to the cows, it ends up in the milk. Or you could have medicinal ice cream. How can you go wrong with that? Uh, so those are some of the things that we're looking at. As well as anything on education. Education from six months all the way up to senior adults to keep them involved in the loop. It's very, very important. But probably one of the most important ones, and you can't see it, is societal. Societal issues. As researchers going forward now, we have to include at least 20% of our research proposals in societal issues. How are you going to solve them? Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Do you want to answer some questions? Sure.